Hello, hello. All right, I'm going to re-record this video again because the other one, I just kind of got off on a tangent because this, this shit is extra nerdy. So today I'm going to talk about bouncing files in place for mixed down purposes and also phase issues, phase correlation, a couple, it's kind of technical stuff, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of try and keep it shorter than the first video. So I have this kick right here. <clears throat> this is a good example of a, a reason why you should kind of take everything that you're doing and get yourself to a good place where you're happy with your song and then, and then balance everything down. There's a bunch of reasons why I'm going to go through them. Um, the first reason is, I mean, you're probably going to save a shit ton of CPU. I mean, I have all these older files here and some of them, there's just like a ton of processing on it. But at a certain point, you know, your CPU up here, is going to start. Not everyone has like a super good computer and mine's pretty good. And I still, I'm still, I'm still kind of pushing it on some tunes, but Okay, see, this is the original kick I had right here. That's no good. Um, as you can see, this this kick isn't even like, it's like a 16 bar kick, the majority of it. It's almost like just a transient. But I've done some processing to it, so I'm going to bounce it now. And oh, hold on a second. Another thing, actually, before I get into this, you can see where this zeroes out. When you drag and drop samples into Ableton, most of the time it's just going to quote unquote zero out. But if you actually hit control J and consolidate this, you can see that it's not exactly like this might not even be. Yeah. See how, like when I do this one, I, I kind of edited this one. Um, these are all, all these kicks are like almost two decibels lower. So you never really know. I mean, Ableton, if you if you process things or you're doing something and then you adjust it, you kind of don't really know. So if, especially if you have like a bunch of processing on the thing after the fact. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this kick and um, this one's been, you know, adjusted, but I'm just going to leave it. It's not going to matter, but you'll see that these are down. So if you want your stuff hitting at zero, I mean, this isn't going to really matter that much pre-processing but um this is a great reason why you should just bounce everything down because you're really going to get a much better representation of where you're at with your levels that's going to that's going to take a lot of stress out of like clipping and things later on and i know that there's going to be some people who see this and go oh 32 bit float dude but that doesn't matter because if you're clipping in digital and then you try and bounce that out it's still clipped it's still four decibels higher than it should be and you just want everything to be at zero sure you can have 32 bit float and have your samples stretch beyond uh, as far as you want and and then if you bounce that, you can just stretch it back. But when you, if your kick is your fucking 12 dBs louder, and then you bounce that out into the real world where everyone else exists, um, it's going to clip. And it's going to fuck up your mastering and your mixing, and it just doesn't make sense. So stop telling people that everything is okay in 32-bit float because not everything is 32-bit float. That's If it's in the DAW, great. 32-bit floats the way to go. If everyone's happy about it. Good job. But yeah, it's you're not you're pushing it. You can't bounce things out and then expect it to just be willy-nilly plus 12 decibels and not have trouble in a mix down process. So I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna freeze the track. I have um I think I have like a saturator on here and like something else. Bear with me there, folks. I'm trying to not I'm trying to not eat up too much this time. The first video was like 40 minutes long. I recommend yeah, I recommend getting a track where you want it and then and then saving as a version two and then have a bounce version. So if you have to go back and fix this like if I bounce this and then I freeze it or flatten it freeze it and flatten it then um 
you can go back and get it if you save a copy. Don't forget to always save your work and back your work up. Okay, so as you can see, these kicks originally were, you know, a 16 bar. Just like this one. This is the bounced version that I did. But you'll see that these things fucking, they just go. Like, where are you going? It goes all the way to, like, here. So it's it's damn near tripled in size almost. You know, if you're looking at the waveform, you know, like, it's going all the way to here. So that's another reason. And if you're doing something that needs to be very technical and clean, like drum and bass music or just faster genre, like, this is going to be a disaster when it comes to, um, you know, not only the groove for your side chain, but, you know, a multitude of other reasons. That's dipping into the bass if you're trigger if your side chain's triggered it's gonna you know your subs not coming back in till over here like it's gonna cause a lot of problems and another thing i recommend is when you bounce and flatten things is you go to the very beginning and then you see this is my first kick and um you can go to here it just doesn't matter but as long as you take the first sample and just you can see that it's kind of pieced out a lot of things like for some reason there because that's where the original sample ended but there's all this extra information that Ableton kind of had to make up in the artifacts take the beginning and just drag it all the way out and then this will get rid of all your you know the iterations that it's made and because these will cause clicks especially if you don't have your settings set but you see these Um, but yeah, you don't want that clicking is the worst and that pushes energy that you can't see or hear exactly into a mix. Like for a clipper or a limiter, like it'll, it'll be, it'll be hitting and you won't really know why. So, um, just drag that out. I recommend dragging it out. I mean, it's kind of a shitty process to have to do, but I, I mean, I go in for all of these and I just would be like, okay, well this kick ends here. So. I'm just going to end it there. <laughs> when you listen to these kicks, you know, it's they're sound they sound the same. You're not changing anything, but you're just cleaning up a lot of the, what the technical issues that it would have are. I still am trying to petition Ableton to just give these fades instead of their default fucking huge cut your transient out fades, but they never do. Um, also, another thing is, is if you look, we got like, we got all this space where the kick was that now, since of, since, you know, whatever issue it had originally because of the latency, the latency in the plugins or whatever you're using, like, you know, if you go in and you look, at, for example, where do I have like a fab filter or something? Like a Pro Key 3, if you throw this on here, it has this button down here. It'll say zero latency or linear phase. Or, so like almost all plugins will have some kind of latency. So that's another good reason why you need to bounce this stuff down is because it'll throw a groove off. You know, if you have these kicks and all of a sudden it's not really like for some reason they're just they're not on time. You know, you want your transient to hit first so your side chains, I mean, any music, your side chain's gonna be triggered the immediate moment it hears the sample. And if you have a bunch of other information that was, you know, let's say in this range of where there was some delay that it's not ducking, you're gonna get some some sort of issues in your, in your mix down process. This is the main kick, but see, I don't have the original to, to look at, but if you look at these two kicks, you'll be able to tell that, you know, this one, it's got issues, but like, if you're, if you look at these, these are the phase of the kick. You can see it's a sine wave. So another good reason is to be able to see the correlation. You know, like this right here, these are looking like they're about to cancel each other out. Almost all these waves look like they're about to cancel each other out. So if you have, um, I'll show you 
<clears throat> I'm going to give you a good example. Let's pull up. I'll just pull up any VST real quick. Let's make a sub base out of this. Flatten that real quick. Okay. Again, once you flatten things, it's not going to show you an exact replication. So if you want to know, and then you control J, consolidate this again, which is essentially like kind of flattening. This is actually negative 12. So if you want this to be, a, you'd want it probably more to be like a negative three range or something. But this is just for the example of the video. I am going to just loop this and then solo these two things and then show you the importance of phase correlation in a coherent wave. So if you bounce your kicks out and you're looking at them and they look like you know this for some reason and you're looking at these and you're going, oh, those look great, but you have, let's say this is your kick wave and then you have your sub wave. Just for the example, these are, are in these these are coherent waves. You know, they start at the same point. They're the same. I just copied them. There's nothing different. Um, so when you play these on top of each other, uh, it, they're going to be boosted by six decibels, which is double the perceived hearing because they're on top of each other and they're the exact same thing. So when you play that, you're going to have a big chunky wave. But if these, for example, if you have a plugin that causes some latency or something, let's say for example, like this channel right here, you you put on some, you know, something that caused some latency or some EQ effects, and then and then it pushed the wave. Let me see if I can get it better. You know, if you, if this is your if this is your your coherent wave where they're both peaking at the same time, um, then it put the latency gets pushed, and then you see these coming together and then you try and play them at the same time. You can hear it almost completely disappearing. That's what a phase issue is going to be in your mix. These are still at full volume. And even furthermore, I'll show you, I'll put a resample channel here and run this and record that. And as you can see, What once was a huge wave is now negative 30 decibels. So this is what we would call a phase issue in a mix. So if you have a kick and you're looking at it and you go, well, it looks great, but then you have something causing the, you know, a latency or some time delay effects or some re whatever it is, and then you try and layer those, they're essentially canceling each other out completely. So that's going to cause issues in your mix. And then this is what people mean when they say phase issues. It's they have to be they have to correlate to the same to the same tone. So if your if your kick is sitting at the same place and then something switches around in it and you don't know what's going on, this is another good reason why you might want to bounce your mix out so you can look at your kick. See the the phase on this, <clears throat> you know, you can tell it looks great. If, for example, you know, you pop up here and you have this, you you wrote your baseline in G so that it's so that it's just like the other. Where did it go? You know, so that it's just like the other one. But then, but then your kick is all out of phase. You know, when you listen back. Kick almost disappears because the, the phase is off. And you can change it so that it's more coherent. But I mean, these are where your issues are going to come from. You hear that kick just totally, totally disappearing because it's just not in phase.
But that's going to be one issue that it's going to cause in your mix later on. And if you're looking at your kicks and you're going, oh, this is a this kick is is a G, and then my bass line's in G, and everything should be working together, and then it's not. That's going to be one of the things that you're going to be suffering in the mix, trying to figure out later on, and have no idea why. Um, I mean, never mind that there was all that extra information that just didn't need to be there that'll cause phase issues too because kicks naturally pitch up so if you're ha you have a sub underneath this your side chain's dipping super hard over here it's not even coming back into here so your bass is getting pushed in where it's way lower where it's going to cause more phase issues you know it's it's just it's a root of a lot of problems that you're not really able to see or you might not even be able to hear it a lot of people haven't just haven't trained their ears enough to be able to hear a lot of things that are problematic in their mix. Uh, something that you can do, if I think that my kick still has a little bit of latency, if you look, Ableton has a built-in option down here underneath the returns. This is the return channel. Um, this is the that's the return section where you put the return effects, and then these are the ins and outs. But the very bottom one is the latency. So you can go here and be like, oh, I have this. And if you look in this bar down here, when you hover over this, it'll have the information that you want. It'll tell you when you hover down here. It'll say, oh, 0 0.0183 amount. So you could say, oh, 0 0.108, you know, two three amount, and then Ableton's gonna offset that. And so this is going to essentially bring this back, you know, whichever direction you want it to be forward or backwards. Um, but that's kind of nerdy. I recommend that, like, just like, like I said earlier, if you bounce this and then you pull all your kicks, when you do that, you just take the first one. I don't use a Mac, but on PC, it's control shift all. I'm assuming on a Mac, it would be like, whatever function max symbol uh, shift or whatever, um, you can Google that. <laughs> but you just control shift that and then these will slide. These will slide right in and you can see it's, it's kind of scrubbing through. I kind of fucked that one up. But this one, you just take the first one and you'll slide it all back and be like, okay, this is finally hitting exactly where I want it. And then you can go in and edit and clean up and delete from there and it'll be a lot easier because all your kicks will be in time. I have a good example of this also down here in my original MIDI where I just took this and I'm going to bounce this real quick so I can give you another idea of issues that some plugins might cause unknowingly uh, <laughs> to you in the process of them remaining in midi or, or the other information that they're using your cpu takes time to read midi also so that can cause some latency if you have a lot of plugins or your computer's not that good or or whatever the issues are you will get latency er errors and issues it might only be in the milliseconds but it makes all the difference sometimes okay so i'm gonna flatten this out and then, now as you can see, this MIDI note, I want to boost the volume on this a little bit, Control J, consolidate it, and see where the volume's even at. Let's call this negative three. As you can see, the MIDI note hits here. So if I open this, this is a time, this is a time frame. So when you make LFOs that look like this, this is where the MIDI note is hitting and you're going to give yourself maybe a whole bar like if this is set to a bar you know and then this is not working until you're way over here this is a whole bar of space this is a hat this will be one bar if this is two this will be one bar so this is a whole this is the volume you know if you have this map to your volume or whatever so if you got if you're using this and you think that you're you're your uh, bass or synth is just going to hit every time on the MIDI, you have to take that into consideration as well. If you want it hitting on the MIDI, you would take this back and you'd take that back. So that's another kind of good reason why. I mean, this is great for if you want to shape something to get a little whip into it, you know, get a little... The original, it sounds like that. But uh, if you want that to make more sense later on, like as you can see, there's this huge gap that's almost... It's almost a 32 
bar out of from what I want it. So that's like a whole note. So it's not even starting here. This could throw your whole entire groove off. Now, if you listen to this, and my ends back on. I don't even have this activated. Okay, so this is just a little bit earlier. See, this is just coming in late. What are we doing here, bro? I just have this turned off, so... So as you can hear, it's it's got a little bit of a delay in it. This is my old channel, but the main sub is actually right here. And I did pull this back so that it starts here. As you can see, it's a little bit more. It's not perfect. I don't want it to be right on the bar, but it's going to help if you have it, if you want your stuff real tight, you want your bass real tight, you want your, your, your shit in there real tight. You'll, you'll be able to hear much better. And pull it where it goes. It's hitting way more tight. It's not as loosey goosey. Um, so that is another reason. Let me see, I got a little bit of a... <clears throat> I guess that's pretty much all I needed to talk about, yeah. It's just better to bounce your plugins down when you get to a point where you're happy and you can just use the audio because, I mean, for one, you might not be able to get your timing right and like I said there's an option in Ableton to offset the latency if you do know how much latency it is 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 being put in or taken out of the the, the track so timing is pretty crucial because that gives everything groove uh, side chains are pretty big I mean if your side chain is is off um, you know whatever two milliseconds and then you have something going on and it's not coming back in you're dipping bass out of your whole entire track by a pretty a pretty substantial amount um clipping once again i'm going to look at this look at the audio it says zero zero i'm going to consolidate that it's still half a db lower so you're getting real time readouts there is another issue that that Ableton has when you bounce in complex mode. I'm going to do a, another whole separate video on that because it's kind of fucking ridiculous. Um, I'll get into that at some other point. But yeah, so you're just getting a more realistic view of what your shit should sound like. If you're really looking for professional mixes, tight mixes, and... You really want you really want everything to kind of be on time. You want to be able to hear and see your mix. So these are all really important reasons, especially if something like drum and bass. You know, when you have a really tight mix, you need it to be very surgical, very clean. Um, there's a handful of things that you need. You need your side chains on time and the latency, not just pulling at the groove of your track. Um, I will be doing another video, a short series of compression, different types of compression, importance of compression, groove and compression from side chain compression, etc., etc. So um, if you guys want to hang around and you and you fuck with my nerdiness. And you can, I'm gonna finish. I think there's already one compression video on my page. You, I'll, maybe I'll. Slap it in the corner around here somewhere. But yeah, I hope this isn't really too much of everyone's time. And I will I'll send you off with a little taste of this new tune that I've been working on. Some drum and bass. Remember, Broadway.